All right, good morning and welcome to our panel on the future of state functionality in the Middle East. Uh, my name is Catherine Warwick. Uh, I'm an associate professor of political science at Villanova University and I direct our Center for Arab and Islamic Studies. And I'm also the editor of the Digest of Middle East Studies, which is one of the journals sponsored by the Policy Studies Organization. Um, this panel is on such an interesting and I think important topic. You know, in political science of the Middle East, we're always studying the state in one way or another. And the role of the state may expand into new areas, states deal with other kinds of, of important and powerful actors. And this sort of development makes it especially important to do what our panelists are offering here today, which is to talk about how and how well states function and how that might develop into the future. So we have three excellent speakers here. Um, I'll introduce them very briefly. Neil Partrick is a consultant and writer on Gulf and Middle East affairs. And we have two speakers from the New Century Foundation. Maria uh, Sapozhnikova, who is the head of the Russian department, and William Morris, who is the secretary general of the New Century Foundation. Uh, I'll let each of them introduce themselves more fully because they may want to do that in the context of what they're talking about today. Uh, our panel goes for an hour and 10 minutes, and I think each speaker is going to speak for about 20 minutes, and we'll have some time for, for Q&A. So I will just turn it over to them. Uh, Dr. Partrick, would you like to begin? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, I should also say that um, I am a, a senior um, fellow of the Next Century Foundation myself, so I guess that's an unhealthy monopoly here, it's three of us, uh, but uh, just in the interest of transparency. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Neil Patrick. Um, I think that's sufficient really from me. I've given the narrowness of time. I'm gonna proceed with my presentation if I may, or would you like others to introduce themselves first? No, this is entirely up to you. Please continue. Fine. Okay. So, I mean, I think the thing to say first off um, is that states, at least as conventionally understood, have a number of key features, which at least in my argument, are lacking when it comes to a number of such states in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, one of the most obvious, and I think key to our consideration here today, is being able to practice sovereignty. The idea that the state itself um, in a defined territorial extent can exercise and practice authority and control within that territorial jurisdiction. This may be internationally recognized, but it also, in my view, has to be at least domestically accepted. As part of that, there has to be, and forgive me, this is like politics 101, but I think it's important to emphasize, there has to be a monopoly of armed force in the hands of the state. When you say that, uh, it raises a number of questions about a number of existing countries in the region. Now, there may be good historical reasons why states might be judged relatively weak or struggling to function in the region, but it's not our job, if I may say so today, to go into those. It's more a matter of where are they now and where might they be heading? Very often when people talk about states in the region, they tend to, in my view, mix them up with their leaders. Now that may not be surprising because there's a number of states in the region in which the leadership and the actual stat, state apparatus and its territorial extent are synonymous. And that in my view is also a problem in terms of their functionality, but it's not always the case. So there's a focus, for example, as there was in 2011 on Egypt and on the leader in particular, the president Mubarak, but he wasn't the extent of the state. And indeed, when he disappeared with his wife and eventually one or two senior security people and his sons, or at least from disappeared from the administration of the country, obviously the state didn't collapse. That shows a degree of integrity, for want of a better word, on the part of the Egyptian state apparatus. But there are a number of countries in the region where power is so personalized, hence I think the leadership and state confusion in a sense, that were the leader and his, and it is a he, uh, immediate family to disappear from the situation, the state, in my view, would essentially collapse. So had Bashar al-Assad been forced from power as a consequence of the civil war, which still has elements of which are continuing to this day, the state as we understand it in Syria would have gone. Such as the narrowness of the apparatus of power exercised by him and his immediate family circle, uh, and the links that go from outwards from that within uh, the military, security and political spheres, it was inconceivable that the Syrian state could outlive his disappearance. And obviously in the context of the US-led invasion of Iraq and the removal of Saddam Hussein from the scene, 
an already weak and fragile state actually stopped existing. There was no longer uh, a clear form of Iraqi authority. Um, the apparatus of state enforcement and control had collapsed even before the army were officially disbanded by Paul Bremer. Iraq as a state stopped existing. This is not always the case. I mean, people in the Tunisian context thought of Ben Ali and his family having captured the state in many senses. And of course the family did very, very well uh, in terms of the appropriation of resources. But again, the Tunisian state survived his disappearance and in many ways prospered at least until fairly recently. I don't wish by saying that to suggest I'm in any sense phlegmatic or sanguine about the situation. I think many of the states in the region have fundamental issues in terms of their functionality. And one of them is, going back to the key features of states, the ability um, of the state leadership to control the gun. Picking on the Iraqi example, uh, as I mentioned it just now, so in a new environment, a reconstruction of the Iraqi state, post Saddam Hussein, in many ways, the formal head of the armed forces, the chief of staff as designated, the Iraqi prime minister, is not able to control that Iraqi gun. In fact, whoever the next prime minister is, and it may be the current one, is a consequence of negotiation within uh, the complex political apparatus of Iraq. And even then, uh, would it to continue to be Mr. Fakadami, it's not actually clear that he would in any sense be able to claim to have authority over all armed force in his country. One reason for this is the semi-sovereign role of the Kurdish entity written into the constitution, of course, and also, of course, the number of elements within the Hashtashabi militia uh, who owe as much fealty uh, to Iran or was influenced by Iran as they are by uh, Iraq and its prime minister. On the question of legitimation, I talked at the beginning about the notion that the state has to be at least accepted in some form uh, by its nationals. We saw obviously in 2011, and we've seen in more recent years, that there's a challenge that's come, at least as I put it, to the leadership of that state in some instances, or indeed to the very state apparatus itself. And that in my view has come, and it still remains a problem, where the so-called social contract, which is a relatively Western concept, or if you like, the ruling bargain or ruling compact between a state's leadership and its nationals had broken down. And to put that compact in crude terms, especially in the wealthier countries of the region, it's along the lines of you feed us, employ us, and we won't riot. Now, in the context of an ever tightening of resources, even within Gulf Arab states, unless their national populations are tiny and they're particularly well endowed in terms of oil and gas revenues, then the ability of the state to command authority and acceptance at least on the basis of being able to feed and employ people is under constant pressure. And given diversification uh, globally, given the desire not to be dependent on any particular part of the world for uh, limited energy resources, this situation, absent, absent very developed economic diversification, seems set to continue. To pick a country like Bahrain, which is one of the poorer Gulf Arab states, and in many senses since 2011, increasingly dependent on Saudi Arabia, as well as um, its historic relationship to Western protectors. Um, legitimacy there has in different ways, arguably been in question for some time, at least amongst its majority population. In 2011, there was a situation where the state, as we understand it, could actually have been fundamentally threatened. Now, by saying this, I'm not seeking to be an apologist for the Al Khalifa leadership. What I mean by that is that the majority call of many Bahrainis was for a constitutional monarchy, which of course would have preserved the position of the Al Khalifa, but in a very new situation. That was a situation where truly the word revolutionary is appropriate, unlike many of the instances in which it gets banded about. A constitutional monarchy in the Middle East and North Africa would be a wholly unprecedented situation. Countries like Jordan and Kuwait might to claim it, but it's just a claim. Bahrain obviously got through that process, shall we say, and is, if anything, more authoritarian, uh, less accountable, and I would argue less legitimate uh, than at any time in its independence history. That's a problem for it, especially as 
in many ways its leadership represents not just a narrow grouping in terms of being a hereditary executive, but also, as I mentioned, being drawn from a minority grouping vis-a-vis -vis self-defining majority. But even in countries in which one can look at leaderships and family monopolization of power, after all, is not something confined to hereditary systems. I was talking earlier about Syria. There was the beginnings of an attempt at a uh, semi-hereditary system in the Egyptian Republic. Um, and indeed, it was beginning to play out uh, under Ali Abdullah Saleh in Yemen uh, until 2011 as well. So when there is that narrow monopolization by a family, formally or informally, it often overlaps with what I would characterize as an ethno-sectarian uh, exclusivity or monopolization of power. Now that's by definition the case in a hereditary system, but more widely, for example, uh, one can see situations where leaderships not just define themselves, but define their approach to power and practice power on the basis of a narrow segment of the wider national population. So for example, um, in other Gulf Arab states, where you could argue, for example, uh, the leaderships are broadly representative of at least the majority of the national population, um, there can be a narrowness uh, in terms of how belonging is carried out. So what do I mean by this? So for example, in Kuwait, where there's a significant sheer minority, but two thirds are broadly speaking amongst the nationals, uh, drawn from uh, Sunni Arab identifying communities. Uh, amongst them though, there are gradations of belonging. There's the cutoff point of whether you can trace your um, existence in Kuwait uh, from before 1920. Qatar has the 1930 cutoff point. So within the Qatari example, you can be a Qatari national, but not have full and equal rights um, with other Qatari nationals if you can't claim that pre-1930 identification. Now that probably doesn't mean that Qatar or even Kuwait necessarily will struggle to function going forward. But I use those examples as indications of where national belonging can be quite unequal. And even in the wealthiest countries, and I've, I've picked up on this amongst Emirati nationals as well, there can be frustrations with informal qualifications uh, as well as formal ones in some instances in terms of their national belonging. This obviously is more of an issue when it comes to countries perhaps of a larger size, um, countries uh, with less resources per capita, uh, situations where, for example, uh, drawing on Syria again, defining itself as the Syrian Arab Republic, uh, by definition, um, exclusivist in that sense in terms of its Kurdish minorities, um, historically, this was the case as Iraq defined itself in purely Arab terms as well. But this is not just a matter of Arab states. Uh, within the, I'm not sure if I'm still being, can you still hear me? We can hear you, yes, your screen has changed. I see she. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, within the Israeli context, um, again, um, a state that in many senses has a self-conception enhanced in recent years uh, as exclusivist in ethno-sectarian terms, can perhaps practice by um, the monopoly of armed force, um, not just within de jure Israeli territory, but de facto uh, running from the Mediterranean to the River Jordan, it can practice control um, and in many senses, Israel has this self-definition of being a form of garrison state. But within that territory, there's obviously a very significant minority, whether they're Israeli citizens or whether they're those within the occupied territories, who do not identify with Israel and can continue to constitute a security and functionality problem for Israel going forward. In a country like Iran, unofficially Persian Shia nationalist, certainly uh, in official terms, Shia Islamist in identification, there are significant minorities that may not be Shia, or if they are, uh, do not come from a Persian background. Whilst the leader uh, is of, I think, mixed heritage and claims a partial Azeri identity. In many senses, the functioning of the Iranian Islamic Republic does not 
effectively incorporate significant minorities like the Azeri or the Baluch or indeed um, the Sunni uh, and Shia Arabs uh, more populated in the south. And this, I think, is not just a question for belonging, but it's, it's a problem in terms of functionality, because if resources are squeezed, if there are security problems, and we've seen this historically in the Iraqi and Iranian and other cases, there can sometimes be more identification uh, with neighboring countries than there can be to the state itself. I'm conscious of time. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm placed. Do I have five oh, more minutes? Yeah, yeah, five more minutes. Okay. And part of this ethno-sectarian exclusivism or um, partiality in the practice of politics, which I've talked about, um, is sometimes written formally into the system. Obviously in the Lebanese case, confessionalism is very much inherent part of the um, constitutional arrangements, at least in terms of the national charter uh, and in terms of practical politics. And this is also the case unofficially, but very much in practice in Iraq. So what's referred to as muhasasa, apportionment or quotas, is very much an ongoing function. So even if Muqtada Asada succeeds in establishing what he apparently wants to do, a majority government rather than a government that seeks to include absolutely everybody and is therefore devoid of opposition, it will still have to play to this muhasasa system. It won't function at all in the first place unless it's able to draw in significant Kurdish representation, Sunni Arab representation. And within that context, uh, a system of quotas, it seems to me, would inevitably continue. An extent to which they're calculated on at least impartial terms, this sectarian basis, is a problem for effective national belonging and also for state functionality. Thinking more to the future, um, in the current context, we can say that Yemen and Libya don't actually exist. They're countries, but they're certainly not states. Um, who's sovereign in Yemen when we talk about, obviously, two rival forms of authority, one nominally based in Aden, the other based in Sana, when we don't clearly have a monopoly of armed forces in the territory of Yemen, uh, and when we have a significant aspiration for southern secession. Likewise, in Libya, we seem to be going back again to two rival forms of leadership and clearly not one predominant form of armed force being controlled by a state apparatus. They don't exist as states, in my view, and I think it's foolish to actually refer to them as such. The Iraqi state is obviously continuing to be fragile in the way I suggested. Kurdish secession is not off the books as a possible objective. Kurdistan has had written into its position a semi-sovereign role anyway. So arguably Iraqi national sovereignty is fundamentally compromised by the extent to which the Kurdish Peshmerga police the borders of the Kurdish entity, uh, issue visas out of what are to all intents and purposes embassies abroad. And we saw recently with the attack by Iran on Erbil on part of that Kurdish entity, an inability of the Iraqi state to do more than criticize a country with which some elements uh, of semi-state militia have relations. This seems to be a fundamental problem for the state functionality of Iraq. Jordan, um, if I can just mention it very quickly, um, is another form obviously of hereditary executive. Uh, it's one that by definition is exclusive therefore. It's also one that has some degree of Islamic credibility as well, uh, given uh, the descent from the prophet. But it's also a country that is fundamentally vulnerable as much as it can claim legitimacy from its Jerusalem role recognized officially by the Palestinians, it's also vulnerable to the ongoing existential problem within Israel that I mentioned and the periodic movement of Palestinians across uh, from territory controlled by Israel into Jordan. Israel itself has its own vulnerabilities that I mentioned. Iran, it seems to me, may get some temporary relief in terms of perhaps becoming more in favor as an oil producer but suffers major economic problems and a narrowness of political authority in the way I described earlier, which I think makes it difficult uh, to see it as a stable country going forward. Any situation where there needs to be economic diversification, and this is, it seems to me, broadly speaking, a feature for a number of countries throughout the Middle East and North Africa, is going to be one in which 
the political leadership needs to incorporate to a degree space for at least comment, observation, uh, or possibly even criticism. Saudi Arabia recently uh, described itself in the form of MBS's comments as a pure monarchy. And yet at the same time, uh, its attorney general was to comment that there is a two-way relationship between the citizenship and the Saudi leadership. How on earth anybody can ever use the term citizenship with a straight face in the context of Saudi Arabia is actually beyond me. But more seriously, perhaps, is the point about the Saudi vision of economic reform, and it's being trumpeted as successful, cannot remotely be judged to be like that unless it's able to create at least a semi-autonomous entrepreneurial class who are able themselves to take on the reins of a degree of economic responsibility, create jobs, rather than be constantly in a situation of dependency upon the state and what the state will allow. And this inevitably would increase the scope for political expression without necessarily uh, having to radically change the nature of the Saudi kingdom. Unless that happens, then I think there's a problem for an ability for the state to meet the expectations of its nationals and to function going forward. I'm very, very aware of the narrowness of time. I may be almost out of it. Um, can I just wrap up by saying very quickly um, that there are a number of attempts by Saudi Arabia, by the Emiratis, by others, uh, Jordan in more recent years, to project a form of state nationalism that is very much focused on its own national territorial borders, moving away from historic claims of Arabism and Islamism. And it's very much a work in progress. And I think unless the state is able to incorporate, as I mentioned, some of those expectations, at least in economic terms, then I think some of those state national projects will constantly be subject to challenge or indeed vulnerability. And even in a country like Oman, seen as a relatively benign leadership, there are periodic demonstrations from those who look to the state to provide resources that it will probably struggle to do so. So very final comment. Sovereignty is at the heart of this. Where is it being held? Who's exercising it? Who's in the room when decisions are being made? If that country is one where vulnerability is so acute, such as in the Syrian case, where foreign allies have to be playing a key role to provide and ensure state functioning, then it's clearly not in the Syrian room in Damascus. And indeed, if it's being purely monopolized within a very narrow circle of leaders and doesn't incorporate wider nationals, then I think there's a problem for the functionality and practice of sovereignty and state integrity going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are saving time at the end for, for questions and comments. So I think we'll just turn to our next speaker. Um, I don't know if, if Maria or William would prefer to go next. Well, I'm happy to, or unless Maria wants to go before I do. I, I, I'll, I'll go next. Oh, and go on, Please Maria. Go on, well, okay, go all right. On, well, thank <laughs> you. you. And then you can be last, you can react <laughs> to exactly. what you have to say. I'm kind of reacting <laughs> partly to Neil. Uh, yes, I'm William Morris from the Next Century Foundation. I'm the Secretary General of the Next Century Foundation. And just I'm um, talking to you from Cornwall, uh, where I am here with my wife. And it is a joy to be in this uh, beautiful sunny weather again. Um, but now, yeah, I wanted to kind of emphasize the international role, I mean, in terms of state functionality. In other words, the responsibility of the great powers and I, I just thought I'd do that by, by referring to specific issues. Uh, we've seen this, I mean, Neil laid out the situation, but um, we, you look at the countries in the Middle East and the international role. Uh, we claim to promote democracy. We love the idea of a democracy. And we say we like democracy, but you look at Libya today, for example, and Neil, mentioned the fact that Libya is in danger of splitting into two with the area controlled by General Haftar and the area controlled in the West by the uh, Mizratans. Um, the, yes, it may well break into two. Uh, there is talk, of, there was talk of national elections. It's very hard uh, to tolerate national elections. You might get uh, Saif al-Qadhafi elected uh, or General Haftar elected, General Haftar because he'd probably fiddle the vote in Benghazi, Saif al-Qadhafi because he's unfortunately um, popular in, uh, in parts of the area. It's difficult to tolerate democracy in the Middle East, and we've seen this again and again in Iraq. Uh, 
um, we have interfered and interfered and interfered in Iraq's democracy. In the very first elections in Iraq, uh, we decided that um, the guns were drawn at the count, actually, and, and we decided that uh, we must we must insist that the uh, that the count was altered. Uh, this is America, United States of America, and Great Britain, uh, specifically, who were present and who were organizing this, and they insisted that the count was altered in order to uh, have some Sunni vote, a small Sunni vote, because the Sunnis had boycotted the elections to a man and to a woman. Every one of them had not voted, and uh, and it, it was um, it was a situation in which we couldn't tolerate that, and so we managed to add some vote for Maliki. Uh, but the trouble is, once you start doing that, once you and I, the Western powers, use our influence to corrupt and establish corruption, then corruption becomes the norm. We do it, and people copy us. And it is a major problem. It's a major problem on so many dimensions. I mean, we have the problem of um, the taking away of citizenship in Bahrain. Who are they copying? They're copying the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland that removes citizenship from people it does not like. Uh, so they copy us and they will they literally point to it. They say, ha ha, but Britain does it, you know. Um, so why can't we? And democracy, we pretend to like democracy. The classic case, Palestine and Israel, the most the most internationally supervised election in history, in history, more election monitoring than ever, that one Palestinian election for the Palestinian Authority. And could we tolerate the result? The result was a disgrace. Those ungrateful Palestinian people elected Hamas. How disgusting. And we immediately put hurdles in the way of that, that government. And perhaps we should have done. Perhaps they are disgusting. Perhaps but the point is that we, why did we pretend in the first place? Why do we pretend and pretend that we want democracy? We want democracy in the Middle East, providing it's our kind of democracy. It's democracy that complies with the wishes of the United States of America and the great powers. And that is the only basis on which we will ever, ever tolerate democracy. And, um, and then the other things that cripple the state functionality in the Middle East, sanctions, sanctions. In some instances, they're not actually uh, called sanctions. I mean, take Lebanon, for instance. Lebanon, a country crippled now, crippled by misery. No power, no, no nothing, even the no rubbish collection, nothing, 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 nothing. Lebanon is dying on its feet. And uh, why? Because of, they don't call them sanctions, but the United States of America, I mean, it has decided in its wisdom that it will ban uh, any banks that have any dealings with Hezbollah. I mean, half the population of Lebanon is Hezbollah, but no, we're not gonna have any banks, any dealings with any banks. Anyway, we have managed to cripple the Lebanese banking system and, um, and slowly cripple, cripple and throttle Lebanon and destroy that country, a country which has to take two or three million Syrian refugees and a couple of million Palestinian refugees. I mean, a country that is, is, has a broken back to begin with, we just, but it's not just Lebanon, Syria. Syria at the moment, you have to queue for petrol for like two days. You, I mean, Syrian people are coming out of this winter, they were freezing. I'm not talking just about the north in Idlib, right across the country. 90% of that country are living in miserable conditions because of Western sanctions. You think Bashar al-Assad is living in mis miserable conditions? Forget it. The Syrian people are living in miserable conditions. Bashar al-Assad is living in a palace. And he has his porridge for breakfast or whatever he wants. 
It is Western sanctions that are crippling states in the Middle East. Uh, Iran, do you think, do you think the, the supreme leader of Iran doesn't have his toast or his breakfast or whatever, or isn't sitting comfortably? Of course he is. The leadership don't suffer under sanctions. It is the people, the populations, the ordinary people that suffer. We're going to do this now to Russia. Actually, it's interesting with Russia because we're going to cut off our own nose to spite our face because we'll have huge gas and petrol prices as a consequence of our sanctions on Russia. Um, but there you go. I mean, it's not a question of the rights and wrongs. Um, it's a question of the use of, and we do it because it's easy. And this, this makes state functionality, it, it does affect state functionality in the Middle East and stability. Recognition is another Western tool of Western weak-minded politicians. So re recognition is used. Oh, we're not going to recognize the Houthi. They're disgusting. Just passed another UN resolution approved by all five P5 members at the United Nations Security Council, including Russia, stating that the Houthi uh, are a, a terrorist movement. I mean, Donald Trump, thank God, he, he briefly took them off the list uh, and we had a chance at negotiations. What is this? There are some negotiations going on in a man in Jordan at the moment, but basically the, the whole process is crippled by this because uh, Neil rightly said that Yemen isn't a state anymore, but in so much as it is a state, it has only one really functioning government, and that's the Houthi government that controls most of North Yemen, with the exception of the province of Marib. The, all the rest of North Yemen is, is Houthi controlled. In the south, you have various actors, probably are the Southern Transitional Council is the main actor that controls most of the south. By the way, Yemen is partitioned. You can have some fiction where the United States of America and Britain recognize some pathetic corrupt government that sits in Riyadh and has never been to the country for the past decade. You, you, can, you can recognize some farce, but uh, Yemen is partitioned already into two countries if it has any existence as a state. And um, the West is such a burden. We're not gonna recognize the Taliban, are we? Wow, no, but that, they're the de facto government of uh, Afghanistan, and we want to move things forward. Arguably, it's not the end of the world if we don't recognize the Taliban. We can, maybe we shouldn't. But if we want, if we want to call the shots about female education and all the rest, be useful to have some embassies there rather than all sitting miles away. That's the other thing we do is is stop diplomatic relations, you know? How can you have functioning international affairs when you don't even have an embassy in the country? Um, it becomes pathetic, but uh, that's what we do. We think, oh, we punish them by, by, by not going there. The British expression is send them to Coventry. Yeah, I mean, oh, we're not gonna talk to you. This punishes you. Oh, we're gonna hurt you. For God's sake, I mean, how childish the Western powers are. We're going to get on and, and change the world without war, and you're not going to talk to your enemies? The Prophet Muhammad talked to his enemies. All the leaders through history have talked to their enemies. But we, the pious modern West, we like to send them to Coventry. We don't like to talk to them. So, And then we have political interference. I mean, um, Neil talked about Mahasisa, uh, the, the formation of governments in Iraq, the process of inclusiveness. And the fact that there is a, uh, a now a move by, by uh, some elements in Iraq to have a, not to have a government of national unity for the first time in modern Iraq history, but instead to have a government with an opposition. And who are uncomfortable with this? United States of America and Iran, both on the same page here don't like change, don't really trust change, bit uncomfortable. Let's try and undermine. I, I think they may not succeed this time, and Muqtada Sada uh, may, may be in alliance with the KDP. 
and Halbusi for the Sunnis, and we may get a government that is not a national government of national unity. Why does this matter? Because it matters because, because the people, ordinary people have been dying in the streets for jobs and for an end to corruption. And the Mahasasa system that Neil was talking about promotes corruption because you have to have jobs for the bar. You get each, each group gets its own. So people are struggling and striving for a better, fairer future. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, our interference has been unbelievable. Maliki too. The Western powers led by the United States of America. Um, actually, it's this in this instance, let's just blame the USA. Uh, I think we leave Britain out of it. The United States of America on its own by itself. Britain has plenty to be accountable for, by the way. I mean, you can't blame the USA for the chaos now in Libya. That's a British led war and the USA was not in the forefront. But on this political interference um, in, in Maliki too, you remember this Maliki second term, he lost the election, uh, but we forced the Kurds, I say we, my mother's American, I'm Anglo-American. We forced the Kurds to come, uh, they had no choice, to come in um, and back Maliki. So thus making, artificially making the loser into the winner. The, the winner in, in, in that particular election, Maliki too, was, um, uh, was um, oh, what's his name? The, I've just, <laughs> anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is that another guy won. Um, uh, got, name's gone out of my head for a second, but don't worry, it'll come to me. Um, and and the the uh, and we we couldn't tolerate it. Now we brought Maliki back, and Maliki became obsessed with power. And then we had a situation in which he started suppressing the Sunnis. Uh, he would arrest wives with husbands. Um, did all sorts of kind of little bit cruel things up in the north. What we get as a consequence, Daesh. You could argue that the chain of events that led to the emergence of Daesh was initiated by the United States of America in its interference in Iraq's democracy. I genuinely, you could argue that. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a distressing state of affairs. We, then military interference. Now, military interference sometimes is necessary. And military interference was necessary to deal with the problem that we perhaps created in terms of Daesh, ISIS, ISIL, or whatever you like to call them. Um, yeah, we had to have military interference. You could, do you know what I often think though? We go into countries in the Middle East as the great destroyers and um, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan. I know this is perhaps a wrong thing to say, but I think colonialism was more honest. Why do I say that? Because colonialism, you went in and then you shouldered the burden. You did not go in, rape a country and walk away, which is the modern way i'm sorry i believe the united states of america and the united kingdom and france and italy the, the all it all got roles you know in country italy and france are major players in libya and even to this minute italy's backing general Haftar, you know and so on we all have our proxy wars don't we we all play these games so a lot of responsibility on our shoulders and what would we like to encourage? Well, if we were honorable people in the United States of America and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and in France, and if we were honorable people, what would we be promoting? Well, we might encourage peaceful change. We might encourage, uh, we couldn't tolerate national elections in Palestine, but we could at least tolerate presidential elections. We could ask Abu Mazin, who makes me look like a young man, we could ask him kindly to step aside for a moment 
and and let some new blood come forward so that we can actually have a functioning Palestinian state. I mean, um, we could oppose hegemonic advancement. I mean, it would be a kind and noble thing to do. Look at Turkey. Turkey's behaving at facts on the ground. It's moved into, it's got its bases in, in northern Iraq. It's just established a new one in Bashika. It already had one um, in Dahuk and others. You know, it sort of moves in. It's moving in, taking swathes of ground in, uh, in northern Syria. It's just outlined, outlawed the Syrian National Council, the, the Turkey has out of the Syrian National Council, the Western back Syrian opposition, a bit of a joke, really, but um, and, and back some very dubious people. Uh, but these little hegemonic advances, we could we could kind of oppose them regionally. I mean, we could support human rights without being partisan. I mean, it's OK. Yeah, let's uh, we support human rights in the countries we don't like, Iran or whatever. But we don't really push for human rights in the countries we love. I'm sorry. I mean, I love the Saudis, but Saudi Arabia, you know, I mean, come on. You can't. Yeah, if you're going to push for human rights, then don't have double standards. Otherwise, shut up. Don't use the human right, UN Human Rights Council to, uh, to, to punish the weak third world countries if you're not going to be fair about it. And we are not fair about it. We are very, very, very partisan and very questionable. Uh, but is there reason for hope? I think there is reason for hope. We have a better situation in the Middle East in many respects. Yeah, I, I believe we have a better chance in Afghanistan, a better chance in Iraq, a better chance in Libya, a better chance in Yemen. Um, why is that? Because, because because maybe because we're not interfering as much as we did a year or so ago. Uh, we've got, you all watched, I love this, this, this analogy. You, you know the Lord of the Rings and the Eye of Mordor. And if the Eye of Mordor is on you and you see it swing around that great eye and then when it focuses on you, you're in trouble. Well, the Eye of Mordor is on Ukraine at the moment. And maybe the Middle East will have a chance to breathe, um, to breathe, because poor, miserable Middle East. But I, there is less war in the Middle East. Uh, not, I know not in Yemen, poor, pathetic Yemen, bombed to bits. But even Yemen, there's a chance. And Libya is less violent. Iraq, perhaps, is less violent. Daesh is on its way out. Maybe Syria is more stable maybe there are fewer people dying and there's a chance. So what am I saying in the end of the day? I mean, I just think the, the West should take on board the old Arab proverb. Uh, it's one we have too. Um, uh, my Arabic is very bad, but live and let the others live. Live and let the others live. We really have to learn to be less of a stumbling block in the way of state functionality in the Middle East and in the world, and to be helpful and supportive and try and nurture a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. We'll turn now to our last speaker, Ria. Hi, uh, I hope you can hear me and um, I want to agree with a lot of what William just said. I'm a head of the Russian department at the Next Century Foundation. And today, uh, naturally, I want to speak how uh, war in Ukraine actually affects the state functionality and will affect the state functionality in the future in the Middle East. Because obviously, mainly I see even more instability to this factor uh, in the whole region. I mean, mostly in the countries like Libya and Afghanistan, Syria and Israel. But I just want to today focus on very precisely on Israel and Syria. So the war uh, in uh, Ukraine actually um, brought a very difficult situation of a lot of uneasy choices for many countries where they had to take 
sides, sometimes not wanting to have sides. So is, Israel is mainly the country that has to go into so-called neutrality in order to preserve its own security. So as you probably all know, after the Russian invasion, the Israeli prime minister was one of the only one who went to Moscow to meet with Putin. And uh, in order to extend the agreement between the sides that, sorry, I'm just saying, people here, <laughs> between the two sides that allows Israel uh, airstrikes of Iranian targets on Syrian territory. However, the situation is very delicate and um, uh, by not properly condemning the war, it puts Israel at odds with the United States and the whole Western world. And um, on the other hand, compromising the, the immediate national security is a very big issue that will uh, undermine the state of Israel. So, and it's a very fragile situation because it will, they will try to maintain this, I imagine, the state of affairs. But until, you know, the war, if it takes an ugly turn, something as, you know, accusations of Russia using chemical weapons or something, Israel will have to take a stand. And uh, then we will be facing, um, uh, well, Israel will be facing big security issues because I'm sure Iran will take a full advantage of this situation as they showed actually in the beginning. So that's concerning Israel. And uh, if we talk about uh, Syria, uh, well, this is a, even a worse situation because I really believe that it's like a very, very difficult situation for Syria. I have a very pessimistic prognosis. I fear even bigger humanitarian crisis and I mean, a big, um, uh, that will be, Syria will be facing regardless whether the war in Ukraine will last for a long time or it will be, short the sanctions imposed uh, on Russia and Syria will definitely remain while those governments are still in place. So, uh, and the public opinion is in, who try to actually somehow punish those who support the atrocities that's committed today by the Russian army in Ukraine uh, will be very, there'll be very little incentive to promote any kind of humanitarian aid in Syria, which is crucial, I think, now and will definitely undermine any kind of potential uh, for the country. And if you like add the looming world food crisis with the wheat prices are skyrocketing and understanding that the majority of people living in uh, refugee camps, they won't even survive those prices. So the functionality is <laughs> really, really undermined. So I basically believe that we do have to do anything in our power today to uh, prevent it because we are we'll be facing the loss of millions of people in the Middle East because of that war in Ukraine, indirectly. So that's my speech today. <laughs> Thank you. And um, because you've been so concise in, in, in putting these, these really powerful points forward, I think that leaves us a bit more time for, uh, for some Q&A. Um, I don't know if we have, I don't see any comments forwarded in the chat, but people are, are absolutely welcome and invited to, to add to the chat anything you'd like to add any of the three presenters today. And since I can do this, perhaps while we wait, I will take advantage of this um, to ask a question uh, to William, if, if I can. Um, mm. Your point about sanctions, you know, it's something that, that we discuss a lot um, and policymakers are very fond of this as a potential tool that, that can be used. And in light of what you said, I wondered if we should understand sanctions as um, showing us a kind of imperviousness of, of regimes. You know, you point out they, that the people at the top tend to survive them perfectly well and the ordinary population suffers. So what does this tell us about, about the states? Is this an avenue toward sort of state fragility in dividing regimes and, and revealing this? Or um, 
does this kind of bolster states and, and their imperviousness to this one tool that, that external powers have? Yes, I'd say it bolsters state. I hear this argument a lot that, and you get it now, particularly with Russia, you know, let's punish the oligarchs and then, you know, they're going to bring down Putin. As if, as if they had the power. I mean, I'm sure they'd love to have a little power. Uh, they, 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 yeah. I mean, you, the classic thing. The the elites the trouble with and and in in states that are run in the this kind of pyramid fashion is that the elites um, have absolute power. And so, uh, and when I'm talking about the elites, I mean the 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 immediate the supreme leader. Um, and sometimes they'll exercise it ruthlessly with regard to their own client group. I mean, Bashar al-Assad, when he came to power in 2000, the first thing he did was to arrest almost all of his first cousins. Uh, he arrested them on charges of tax evasion. Uh, they all had little militias with them. Um, and uh, <laughs> So it was a problem for the, the, the Syrian army or, and police force to go and arrest these guys. But Basho said they're going to have to be arrested. And, and he put them in jail, by the way, for two years, all of his cousins. Uh, he just wanted to keep them in line. Um, one of them ran away to Lebanon and, and, the, and the army tried to chase him. And he had his own little militia group with him. And so, and the army was so frightened of chasing him because they might frighten that the guys would turn and fight that, um, that they would phone ahead and say, we're coming. And then he could move on to the next hill and get out of the way. But I mean, you see this again and again, and of course you see it. Um, uh, and, and Bashar in more recent years has, has confiscated the assets of all of his elite um to use them for this for his own purposes or for the state you could argue to to shore up the coffers of the state because the state was had weak coffers we get the same uh of course with Mohammed bin salman bless his cotton socks and he's um, he's in prison many of his rivals um and and confiscated their assets um so you know your life as a oligarch is dodgy because you'll either get them confiscated by the west or confiscated by your own re ruler but the idea the concept that somehow by punishing those around the the ruler you're going to punish the ruler you're not it's not so um and clearly the misery of sanctions is in uh, just inconceivable the misery they have caused and have caused over the years the um back in those days under saddam Saddam used to kind of revel under sanctions. He would blame the West um, and with just some justification, but he'd actually exploit the blaming of the West for the sanctions. And um, babies were dying in hospitals. Uh, I mean, I was in Iraq under sanctions and, and you, you couldn't, I, I, you wept if you went into a hospital because mothers would run up to you thinking you were a doctor because you had a white man's face. Um, with their dying children in their hands, with their dying ch children uh, and in, those, in those five or six years of sanctions under Saddam Hussein, the last days of Saddam Hussein, children died in their countless thousands. Because children, because what happened under sanctions was that the, the, the price of, um, I'm sorry, I'll shut up in a second, but the price of, of ordinary things, staples like wheat and so on, could be maintained. So um, that element of the diet was there. And wrinklies like me can survive on um, a carbohydrate diet. But children need a bit more of a balanced diet. And you used to get terrible problems with kids, terrible problems with kids um, uh, under sanctions. And so anyway, I, I could go on. But the point is, I think that sanctions is a blunt instrument um that is actually dirtier than war if uh, less honorable than war in war you're you're manning up in sanctions you are a moral and actual coward in your, your behavior i i think the western approach is simply shameful sorry but there we are that's my opinion
Thank you. It, it's good to have such a, a direct and, and, uh, and, and passionate answer. One of the things I notice here is that um, Maria and William have, have both given us um, really clear statements about the obvious costs of failures of state functionality. When functionality is reduced, lives are at stake. And all three of you have contextualized this by, by sort of revealing the many layers of this. You know, um, um, Neil talked about belonging and the relationship between belonging and functionality. And we have the regional factors that shape the calculations of the state and the ability of the state to act. And then these international factors um, that our last two speakers spoke about, you know, when, when external powers are making decisions, these affect how the states can function or what decisions they're likely to make. Given how important this is and what's at stake, how, how should we think about the future of this? Should we expect these states to change form in response to these pressures? Should we expect them to, um, to behave in different ways in the future than they have in the past, um, given the, the sort of how, how this functionality of the state is situated in the factors you've all identified? So if any of you could speak to that, I think it would be interesting. Yeah, could I could I pick up some of that, Catherine? Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, it it seems to me that um, one of the ways in which the Syrian leadership, at least, is dealing with sanctions, and I think this was implicit in in, in William's comments, um, is to operate in the context of a by definition black market, uh, and to survive as best it can. Indeed, to some extent, to prosper. Uh, and there are a lot of allegations out there, I'll just call them that because this is a public forum, about the various ways in which the Damascus leadership have been able to prosper in the context of sanctions. And this underlines the point about perhaps it's the public who are suffering and the elite who are not, as William was saying. I don't think any of that, though, is related to state functionality. That's related to the functionality of the family fiefdom, of the narrowing circle of power that William described around Bashar al-Assad, just as the circle of powers of Saddam Hussein, narrowed increasingly, encouraged to some extent by the operation of sanctions and also war devastation that he'd been largely responsible for, power narrowed further and further. And we've seen that also in Syria and perhaps sanctions play their part. If you wish to be conspiratorial about it, you would argue that sanctions are uh, designed in many senses to weaken the state apparatus as much as they are to try to weaken the leadership. In fact, if anything, the leadership seems to survive in the context of sanctions. Um, the position of the al Houthi uh, in ruling out of Sana in Yemen is one in which they're clearly struggling, uh, not least because of the blockading of Hodeida port and so on and so forth, but they are able, broadly speaking, to operate. I mean, they use ideology, they use mobilization of different kinds, but sanctions won't necessarily destroy their war fighting capability, war fighting capability. In fact, they've proven an ability to innovate, um, regardless to some extent of Iranian assistance. So I think in a way we're almost mixing up two things. Sanctions um, can paradoxically assist a leadership to survive and it will find other ways to operate and narrow its circle of control, which ultimately might undermine it. But the state itself is just further weakened by sanctions. I mean, we are talking about countries, those that are under the most egregious sanctions, that have a form of authority that's entirely personalized, as I was suggesting, where the leadership and the state, and forgive me, William, this is why I use the word regime, where the person in power and their immediate circle and the state, there's virtually no differentiation. So if the leader goes, I would argue, the state collapses. In that sense, we have a regime, unlike those situations where the leader goes, like in Egypt, the state remains in place, essentially a military-led regime in Egypt since 1952. So sanctions are helping to weaken states' function. And we saw this in Iraq throughout the 1990s. They're not necessarily, at least in the short to medium term, weakening the position of leaders themselves, who in any case have increasingly come in these instances to see what there is of the state as a platform for their own interests and the, the wider circles of power that they try and enjoy, as opposed to broadening the basis of involvement. Now, I'm not saying it's just Syrian, the Syrian leadership that's responsible for that situation either. It's about family leadership survival. It's about war and conflict. But make no mistake, the Syrian state, even if it manages to crush the final remnants of resistance, barely exists. I mean, it's dependent upon foreign fighters, those it invited, as opposed to those it's supposedly battling. 
and Israel itself, uh, it was suggested by Maria, though the conundrum of whether it's acting out of national security or not, uh, takes such a wide view of its national security, it too is playing a part in undermining Syrian sovereignty as well, such as the range of targets that Israel will, will focus on. Anyway. Thank you. And I wonder if, if Maria would like to expand a little bit more on, on this question of state functionality as affected by these external factors and then how the states make decisions in that context. Uh, well, there is, I believe, a real difference, the sanctions, because a lot of those states we're talking about, they are involved in the proxy wars right now. So their decisions are not necessarily theirs. They're pushed by bigger uh, entities behind them. So sanctioning them, it probably doesn't make the same difference as would say if you sanction Syria as you would sanction Russia, because whatever they do, they, they, it all depends on the decisions made in Kremlin at the end of the day. So that's the big difference, I would say. And uh, maybe the approach has to be a little bit different of how to uh, you know, like create, uh, bring the democracy as we want it, bring uh, stability and well-being because what you want in the functional state is the well-being of its citizens. So in order to get the maximum benefits from that, you just have to, you have to probably change our approach a little bit. Indeed. We have a couple of minutes left. So if, if there are any points that, that any of the speakers wanted to return to, uh, that they wanted to elaborate a little bit further. We do, we do have a little bit of time. If, if I'm allowed to, is that okay? Just very, very yes, quickly. Um, I just would like to also underline this point about um, the exclusivity, even in relative peace, even in the context of um, relative economic prosperity. Um, we're talking about Maybe the historical antecedents are partly to blame here, um, Britain's role notwithstanding, but the narrowness of an elite's form of power. I mean, for example, in, in Gulf Arab states, as I mentioned, um, and this is not something that can necessarily be resolved away by uh, a dispersal of a, a broader basis of rent, as they call it, you know, from going from oil to a post oil economy, the state still making the key decisions uh, involving the networks as it wishes in order to prop up its form of authority. Even that um, isn't necessarily something that's sustainable for some of the less wealthy Gulf Arab states. It might be doable for Qatar and the UAE. Saudi Arabia has 25 million plus population. Um, a huge proportion of those are actually nationals in its case. its case. It has a growing unemployment problem. It currently has enormous support for the leadership on the basis of a social decompression but its economic progress has been extremely limited. And in that sort of context, you know, relative stability, having overcome its main security problems that we saw in the 90s and the noughties, uh, it has fundamental challenges. The state, in many senses, we think of it as strong because of the capacity of one particular monopolizer of state leadership being able to arrest, in some cases, cousins uh, and part of the wider circle on a very selective basis whilst corruption obviously continues in other ways. But that's not a strong state. That's a strong leadership without a basis for institutional accountability or dispersal of authority. And ultimately, if things go wrong or Saudi Arabia doesn't measure up to the targets it set of itself, there will be questions asked because it doesn't have the kind of largest to disperse to make its position stable. And I think part of this also relates to the issue of a kind of ethnic narrow narrowness of power as well. Many of the countries in the Middle East um, have leaderships that have come to power in the context, partly out of a colonial heritage, of seeing themselves uh, as representing a particular group within the wider country. And that can exclude others from decision making or from representation. So that ethnic element, it's even there in the politics of Sudan. They co-opted some of the former African rebels from Darfur and elsewhere. But it's essentially it's a Sunni Arab led military orientated regime, I'll use that word. And that's not a sustainable basis for state functionality going forward. William, you, you wanted to jump in here. Well, just uh, just just Neil's comments reminded me of, um, it's an interesting argument, Neil, that, that we reminded me of old Saddam Hussein, who used to say, Anna Iraq, wa Iraq Anna. <laughs> 
I, I am Iraq and Iraq is me. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, and he, he would say that. I'd say in his speeches. Um, and um, yeah, is, is, is it not a state when you have an absolute dictator um, uh, that, and power is... I can, I can see what you're driving at. I can see what you're saying. But um, what I would argue is um, I, I love democracy. And, I, and in a way, democracy is an elected dictatorship. We have them for four or five years and then we get rid of them and we have a new lot. I mean, you know, who can get rid of Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom? You have to wait for an election um, to, to, to say goodbye to him. Um, I mean, perhaps you love him. It's OK. I, uh, I quite liked him to begin with. The point is that the point is that we do we do have this kind of. Uh, centralized power in, in some degree everywhere but at least in in the western democracies we can get rid of them the um the the but the the states whatever they are what i'm trying to argue i i respect what you're saying uh, that that these supreme leaders of the of the kind you're talking about uh, mohammed bin salman bashar al-assad or whomever um are not then they're not states in 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 the way you envision a functioning state but um but i would argue that whatever they are we need to now have a different attitude to them an uh, attitude of being constructive and finding ways to promote peaceful change without sanctions and without war um and talking to our enemies um and then we might have a we might build a safer, better Middle East, and uh, that that and it's getting there. I, I do I do think there's there's every chance we could do that, but we still do step on people's toes. I mean, there was a move to bring Syria back into the Arab League, and there's an Algeria meeting of the League of Arab States around now in March. I think it may have just happened, or it may be just about to happen. Um, and they were going to invite Syria. And I believe the United States of America said, no, you must not. I, arguably, Saudi Arabia wouldn't have permitted it anyway or whatever. But, um, but there was a move to include them. Is it so bad to talk to your enemies? I, I just think I would like to see a U.S. embassy reopened in Damascus and in, in all the other nasty places. I mean, providing the security of the diplomats could be guaranteed. Um, and because I just don't think it helps this this approach, and I think we need to be helping build a better world instead of being part of the problem, is what I'm arguing. But okay, that's thank you. Um, thank you all. I think by the clock we are just now at the end of our session. So I want to thank all three of the speakers for a really really interesting commentary and and discussion afterward. This has been wonderful, and we really appreciate your expertise here. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank chairmanship. You. Yes, indeed. Thank, Thank you, you, Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.